Hello and welcome to the first in a series of presentations that aim to assist you in navigating the various health and community supports in the inner and outer eastern areas of Melbourne. I'm Bronwyn Williams and I'm the EMSCA coordinator. And as the EMSCA coordinator, I'm part of a group called the Eastern Regional Coordinators and I'll tell you a bit about them in a moment. But firstly, the Eastern Regional Coordinators acknowledge the Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples of this nation. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we are located and where we conduct our business. We pay our respects to ancestors and elders past and present, and we're committed to honouring Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's unique cultural and spiritual relationships to the land, waters and seas and their rich contribution to society. The Eastern Navigation Resource is developed to provide a resource for workers across inner and outer Eastern Melbourne to navigate the various health and community support sectors for the benefit of the people, the consumers and carers and their families that they work with. The objective is for people within these areas of Melbourne to be provided with a more seamless journey to the right supports to meet their individual needs and experience warmer support pathways. This guide aims to support appropriate referrals for people. The guide covers the inner and outer eastern areas of Melbourne and is focused on orienting staff to the available health and community service sectors. It's not a comprehensive list of services, but rather shows you the door to enter each sector with some understanding of what's offered and what you'll need to do. The Eastern Regional Coordinators Group bring you the Eastern Navigation Resource. This group was founded by the Department of Health and Human Services in 2014 to bring together the health and community services area coordinators whose role it is to promote and facilitate service coordination across the region. Key aims are to reduce duplication of effort in providing navigation tools for the various sectors when the groups of people accessing services are largely similar, supporting integration across sectors with workforce development, role modelling, promoting collaborative practice and training and sharing relevant data and information across health and community service sectors. We also seek opportunities to strengthen partnerships, links, responses and referral protocols. Membership of the Eastern Regional Coordinators Group is represented here and includes the following sectors, homelessness, family violence, family services, mental health, AOD, alcohol and other drug, children and families, Aboriginal services and the NDIS. It's been identified by many findings from various um, investigations into health and community services, but in particular, the Productivity Commission findings 2020 and the Victorian Mental Health Royal Commission report 2021, that the navigation of supports for people is a key area of need. Issues with navigation of supports are identified as common concerns in both reports and the impacts on consumers, their families and the people who support them are outlined. Online and centralised navigation portals are recommendations from both reports in an effort to improve the provider's understanding of available services when assisting people. So this navigation guide aims to bridge the gap for service providers in lieu of a suitable multi-sector online navigation platform. The guide will assist you as a service provider to understand the key entry points to the range of service sectors. It's divided into sector specific sections and contains information to assist staff to know the eligibility criteria, catchments and suitable entry points. It also includes some useful links and demystifies acronyms and terms for each sector. This guide does not intend to provide a comprehensive list of services and support, but rather key access points that will assist with service navigation. It contains a glossary of common terms and acronyms used in the various sectors covered by the guide from page 51. This resource is current as of January 2022 and the authors take no responsibility for the ongoing accuracy of the content. However, we've included web links which you can use then to refer to when accuracy is required. So the next update to this resource will occur this year to include Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander supports, community legal services, culturally and linguistically diverse and migrant support information. In this session on mental health supports, uh, you will learn how to decide which type of mental health support may be useful to people and how to effectively access them. I'll be referring to information contained in pages 39 to 47 of the Eastern Navigation Resource. But first, a bit of historical context. Many of you will be familiar with the changes to mental health services over the past 30 years or so, including deinstitutionalization. But for those of you who are not, this represents the shift from a one-stop shop institutionalised care 
for people with mental illness to community-based mental health supports. This is somewhat simplified, of course, and focused on tertiary supports. However, this picture illustrates the system change that have identified the need for coordination of supports over time. So you can see that it's become increasingly complex to navigate the mental health service sector. And we can see in the, between 1988 and 2013, we had um, the clinical mental health services working alongside what we used to call psychiatric disability rehabilitation support services. And uh, those two um, areas of service provision were uh, necessary because most people were living in the community in those years. Uh, and then we st started to prepare for the role in of the NDIS and there was a massive reform of the mental health community support sector. Uh, so we now see that um, in, in this present day, we have the NDIS for people with psychosocial support needs, clinical mental health services, stepped care, and also a variety um, of other psychosocial supports. So we're now in the midst of the most significant development in mental health care since deinstitutionalisation in the 90s. The Royal Commission into Victoria's mental health system provides a five volume report with a series of 65 recommendations that will substantially alter the systemic response to people experiencing all levels of mental ill health and hopes to provide a more integrated, holistic, person-centred and staged approach to care. We all need to be part of the change. Acknowledging that things are changing, let's look at what's currently available to people requiring more support with their mental health. When a person requires help with their mental health, it's important to first consider who is already supporting them. They may have a private psychologist or psychiatrist, along with family supports. Getting in contact with existing supports with consent will greatly assist in the planning of next steps. Meet or at least speak with the existing supports with consent and as a team, identify any gaps in support that may have led to deterioration, even hospitalisation. As many mental health conditions are episodic, it is common for someone with psychosocial disability to need different levels of support over time. A decision needs to be made about the type of support a person requires. Generally, people begin their recovery journey by accessing treatment-focused supports, and this would normally begin with a visit to their GP. When a person has ongoing mental ill health, they're likely to need both treatment and psychosocial support. We can see here a breakdown of what constitutes treatment and what is classified as psychosocial support. Mental health treatment needs include assessment, diagnosis and treatment and monitoring. Psychosocial support needs uh, are those for people's ongoing challenges that are related to their mental illness. So managing daily tasks, making connections with other people, community participation, getting out there and meeting others, finding houses, um, undertaking, oh, and even, even maintaining housing, undertaking work or study, and becoming physically more active. Now let's have a look at how all this fits together. So here's a pictorial to assist you with locating the right support pathway for people experiencing varying degrees and types of mental ill health. I'm going to try and make this sound as simple as possible. It's actually really quite complicated, as you can see. So the Eastern Navigation resource is focusing on entry points to get you started. For people feeling anxious, depressed or not quite right, they can see their GP and under better access, they can develop a mental health care plan that enables them to access a range of mental health practitioners for a series of individual and or group sessions that they will pay for and receive some rebate from Medicare. The sessions may be face to face or via telehealth particularly in rural and remote areas and during pandemic lockdowns. If a person needs more specialist treatment, they may access private psychiatry if they can afford it, or they may be eligible for stepped care if they're considered disadvantaged. Tertiary mental health services are for people in mental health crisis, they can see them there in the red, or requiring treatment for an acute episode of mental ill health. I'll talk about this more in a, in a short moment. A range of psychosocial supports you can see under here uh, um, exist now to support people who are not accessing the NDIS, so this green section here. But to begin with, we have community supports in the form of health services, community houses and various support groups in every area of Melbourne. 
For more challenging support needs and where a person is not currently accessing NDIS, community supports in the form of health um, NEMI, uh, Commonwealth funded psychosocial support services and also Wellways uh, who work alongside NEMI to provide these Commonwealth um, supports. Uh, these really are to fill that gap for people um, who have not yet accessed NDIS or who need to test eligibility for NDIS. So there are also uh, another set of psychosocial supports. Uh, we call it Towards Wellbeing in our area. It's delivered by each. And this is a partnership with Eastern Health Mental Health Program. So uh, this particular type of support is only available to people who are currently connected to the Eastern Health Mental Health Program. And they provide something similar to what NEMI and Wellways provide outside of Eastern Health. Um, and this service uh, will help people to access the NDIS and provide them with some psychosocial supports to bridge any gap there might be in their support needs. So if you're needing some help to navigate mental health and AOD supports in our region, there is one place you can go, and it's an online platform. You might be aware of Head to Help, which emerged during the COVID restrictions. Head to Help has become Head to Health to align with the Australian Government initiative of the same name. So when a person calls, calls Head to Health on 1800 595 212, an experienced mental health professional can listen and work with them to find the best way to get the help they need. And practitioners can also call, call Head to Health for help with navigating. Okay, so as I promised, here's a quick overview of the mental health services as they currently are. As I said, things are about to change. There's a major transformation in the wing. The Eastern Health Mental Health Program is guided by the Collaborative Recovery Model and the Victorian Mental Health Act 2014. Services are divided into age ranges and also into community and inpatient. A large proportion of mental health services at Eastern Health are based in the community. However, we have an inpatient unit each for aged and for child and youth mental health services, and we have three inpatient units for adults. The types of supports that we provide are crisis and assessment teams and prevention and recovery care facilities, and these are available to support people in the short term to avoid hospitalisation and also to support people in the early days of discharge from hospital when their needs are still acute. These are outreach services. Um, all, however, the prevention and recovery care is um, is a unit or that we have units for people to stay in as a step up and step down from hospital as well. Community care, continuing care teams, sorry, also known as CCTs, provide case management and treatment support for people who are less acute and they require less frequent clinical supports. However, we do have a mobile support team and these, or two mobile support teams, and these are for people with ongoing and more intensive treatment and rehabilitation support needs who are living in the community. Community care units are also available uh, for medium-term rehabilitation focused accommodation. And this is where a person requires support with living skills to enable them to live again successfully in the community. A range of specialist supports are also available for dual diagnosis, which is mental ill health and substance use issues, family violence, forensic personality disorders, suicide intervention, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, social and emotional well-being. And there's a single entry point for all mental health services here at Eastern Health. Just to keep it easy, you only need to call 1300 721 927. For urgent help, assessment takes place via the mental health access teams. The level of risk to self and others will be made at this assessment and the response will be decided by trained clinicians as part of a multidisciplinary team. Ultimate responsibility for assessment of safety rests with the consultant psychiatrist. Please contact triple zero though, if you or someone you know is at immediate risk of harm. So people can either be treated as voluntary or they can be required to engage with treatment under the Mental Health Act. This is currently under review also, but for now, the Mental Health Act 2014 criteria for compulsory treatment is as follows. So section five of the criteria is enacted if the person has a mental illness, and they need immediate treatment to prevent serious deterioration in their mental or physical health or serious harm to self, others or themselves. Immediate treatment will be provided under this Act and there's no less restrictive means that are reasonably available to provide that treatment. 
So as you can see, a lot of assessment needs to go on to make sure that we have this right. Some potential um, challenges to accessing mental health services are that people must be in crisis to accept, access the tertiary mental health supports at Eastern Health. Is the person in immediate risk of suicide or are they experiencing severe mental health symptoms which put themselves or others at risk? That's the question to ask before you, when you're calling triage. The person will be assessed over the phone, which can be challenging for some people, and they may also enter via emergency services like with police or an ambulance and or the emergency department of the hospital. This can be an anxious time for the person and for their family and friends. Information for contacting mental health triage I've already provided you with, uh, so that 1300 721 927. When you call, provide detail regarding the person's name, their current address, their phone number and their date of birth if you know these things. Be clear about your observations of the person and or any specific information gathered about the situation from carers. Use mental health assessment terminology when you can and state why you require the assistance of mental health services at this time. So why now? It's really important to describe the safety issues uh, accurately. So remember the slap to describe the risk of harm. Specificity, how specific is the plan? The more specific the details relate, the higher the degree of the present risk. Lethality, how lethal is the proposed method? How quickly could per the person die if the plan is implemented? The greater the level of lethality, the greater the risk. Availability, how available is the proposed method? If the tool to be used is readily available, the level of suicide risk is greater. Proximity, what is the proximity of helping resources? Generally, the greater the distance the person is from helping resources, if the plan were implemented, the greater the degree of risk. And what are the current the person's current supports? For example, family, friends, services, networks. Consider whether emergency services or police or ambulance are more appropriate point of contact and be prepared to pursue support if the client is assessed as high risk by your organization's risk assessment method and you don't have any other source of adequate support to maintain their safety or the safety of others. And this may involve a call to triple zero. Make sure you document your conversations and your plans. Okay, so moving along to psychosocial supports. There are three main ways to access psychosocial supports for people in Eastern Melbourne. See uh, the figure B for navigation information in the guide. The NDIS provides plan support for people with significant disability resulting from their mental illness. There's a process involved in testing eligibility and then setting up a plan of supports, and this can take some time. Additionally, not everyone who applies for NDIS will be found eligible. For these reasons, there are Commonwealth and state funded psychosocial supports to meet people's needs whilst they're testing eligibility and setting up their plan, and also for people who do not yet qualify for the scheme. There are two main types of alternative psychosocial supports as follows. For people who are not currently with Eastern Health Mental Health Case Management or the NDIS, as I mentioned earlier in the larger diagram, in that green section, there are Commonwealth government funded program called the National Psychosocial Support Measure. And it's provided by NEMI National and Wellways and is funded under the Eastern Melbourne PHN or auspiced under the Eastern Melbourne PHN. This provides up to 12 months of support for people of all ages who are not currently accessing NDIS, but please note that they may have met the NDIS eligibility, but don't yet have their funded supports in place. Testing NDIS eligibility is a key function of this support service. Uh, for people who are with Eastern Health, Mental Health Case Management, the Victorian government has funded the Early Intervention Psychosocial Support Response, or EPSA, to enable people to access psychosocial supports when they are either found ineligible for NDIS or not yet ready to apply. So similar to the psychosocial support measure, but this service is, is provided by each and only for Eastern Health Case Managed clients. It provides up to 12 months of support to people who are between 16 and 65 years of age and testing NDIS eligibility once again is a key function of that support service. And this map is in the guide and can be used to navigate to the correct supports. If you need help deciding which support might be appropriate, you can also simply contact Head to Health, as I mentioned earlier. 
To join the NDIS, uh, people need to meet access requirements. So I just want to talk a little bit about that. This includes uh, the scheme being available in their area, their age, their residency status and the nature of the disability. Now, if the NDIS is across all areas now. The age needs to be somewhere um, between 0 and 65 years. People need to live in Australia and have Australian residency. Uh, and they need to need support from a person because of a permanent and significant disability. They might need special equipment because of a permanent and significant disability, and they need some supports now to reduce future needs. Psychosocial disability is a term we use to describe a disability that might arise from a mental health issue. And not everyone who has a mental health condition will have a psychosocial disability, but for people who do, it can be severe, longstanding and impact on their recovery. People with a disability as a result of their mental health condition may qualify for the NDIS. So the types of supports that the NDIS might fund for participants includes, you know, daily personal activity support, transport to enable participation in the community, uh, in social, economic and daily life activities. Uh, it might support workplaces to allow participants to successfully get or keep employment. Uh, it, provides therapeutic supports, including behaviour support, help with household tasks to allow participants to maintain their environment, helping to participate by skilled personnel in aids or equipment assessment, set up and training, home modification, design and construction, mobility equipment and vehicle modifications. So there's a range of supports, but we have to be very clear that it's related to the person's disability and not to provide health related supports specifically. Some potential challenges in accessing the NDIS are that people with psychosocial disabilities may not see themselves as disabled. They may also object to the idea of their condition being deemed permanent. Along with mistrust of the scheme, many people are declining to apply for NDIS who would otherwise be eligible due to psychosocial disability because they don't resonate with the language of the NDIS. As a support person, your role can be to assist people with psychosocial disabilities to weigh up their support options and consider testing their eligibility for the NDIS. You can outline the benefits of this individualised approach to support and have a recovery co focused conversation about what they'd like and need in order to live a more meaningful life. And just want to mention again Support Connect, which has been commissioned by the Eastern Melbourne Primary Health Network and provides a new one-stop platform for the navigation of mental health and AOD supports in the Eastern Catchment and also in the Northeastern area. It's designed for ease of navigation and has tailored information for consumers, families and supports and also for service providers. It's a really terrific new resource and I just wanted you all to know about it. Um, Obviously, you can hear that there's a lot to know around mental health supports. So this is your one-stop place to go and find that information, along with Head to Health. Um, also, Ask Izzy. So Ask Izzy can be really valuable if you're looking for a wide range um, or a variety of social and health supports for people. Uh, so go on the website and have a look at that too. And for more information about mental health support navigation, please go to the EMSCA webpage. You can see the link here, or you can contact me directly, and I'm always ha happy to assist you. Uh, thank you very much for your time today, and I hope this has helped you to understand uh, how we navigate to mental health supports for people.